Hello, this is one of a series of short videos to introduce my course History and Systems of Psychology. As for the whole of this course, the set text that we're using is Morton Hunt's The Story of Psychology, and students should read the relevant chapter for more information. Today, I'm going to talk briefly about the ideas of William James, the American philosopher and psychologist. Born into a wealthy New York family in 1842, he died in the summer of 1910 in New Hampshire at the age of 68. Unable to decide on his life's course during his 20s, he finally settled on the life of an academic in 1872, being employed by Harvard University from then until his retirement. Initially hired to teach physiology, he soon broadened his classes to cover psychology and philosophy. Psychologists rightly see James as one of the founding fathers of their discipline. Indeed, James was one of the first people in the world to lecture on the then newly developing field of psychology. This was in 1874-75. Uh, James himself once jokingly said that the first lecture he ever heard on psychology was the one he himself gave. Uh, he also established one of the first psychology laboratories in 1875 and wrote one of the most influential early textbooks on psychology in English, The Principles of Psychology, a massive volume that came out in 1890 after James had worked on it for 12 years. And I should say, which unlike most classics, is still widely accessible and uh, some people still read it. James had a distinctive understanding of what psychology was, which was fundamental to his work. First, one of the most crucial points to make is that he thought that it was still too soon to describe psychology as a science. Rather, for the present, it was only the hope of a science. Psychology had not yet produced a single law comparable to the laws of physics, nor a single proposition from which a consequence could be deduced. Psychology would only achieve scientific status when its practitioners were able to understand the connections between brain states and the corresponding states of mind. That understanding would be an outstanding achievement for science as a whole, enabling us to know the laws of conscious mental life. Second, one of the primary corollaries of James's conviction that psychology was not yet a science was his refusal to limit his interests to a single framework or conceptual area. Anything that was interesting was worth studying. Not only was James fascinated by conventional psychological questions, but he was also willing to explore matters outside accepted scientific bounds. Notably, his interest in spiritualism and psychical phenomena, uh, which he regarded as extensions of abnormal psychology. In this regard, not only did he attend seances, but in 1884 co-founded the American Society for Psychical Research. Another characteristic view was that although James was trained in medicine and fully conversant with the physiological work of his day, he felt that what it revealed about the human condition was strictly limited. He did not deny its importance and praised the work of physiologically oriented psychologists, but he believed that these findings only represented a small part of the potential knowledge that was to be gained in psychology. Again, James felt it was still too early to develop an all-embracing grand theory for psychology. He dealt with a wide range of psychological phenomena, but never tried to force everything into a single unified framework or system. Even more than this, he avoided presenting his ideas as a coherent whole. He refused to be tied to a closed system of thought, often preferring to present both sides of a question, accepting the contradictions, and thus laying out a problem for consideration and debate by others, rather than resolving it. Finally, we should also emphasize that unlike most psychologists, James was a major philosopher as well as a psychologist. 
philosophical concerns were always fundamental to his work and interlink in various ways with the study of psychology. I'll add a video on his philosophical concerns at some later date. Turning now to Jamesian methodology. As might be expected, James's way of studying psychology were diverse, eclectic, and pragmatic. Four elements can be mentioned. The conventional following of the work of others and experimentation, and the more specifically Jamesian form of introspection, and what he referred to as psychologizing. Following the work of others may seem obvious, but had particular importance at a time when psychology was just beginning as a modern academic discipline. Thus, all the way through his career, even after his primary focus had shifted away from psychology to philosophy, James still kept up with the latest developments in psychology, reading widely across many areas of psychological interest, gathering reports and clinical studies. In this regard, we should remember that James was fluent in several European languages, so was able to maintain a genuinely international perspective. Uh, so, for example, he was the first American to call attention to Sigmund Freud, this in 1894, when Freud was still obscure and largely unknown in the English-speaking world. Again, he maintained a widespread and regular correspondence with European scholars, many of whom he had met during an extended study tour of Europe he had made in 1882-83, visiting universities and faculty. Although James's own experiments were only a minor source for his ideas about psychology, he was not opposed to experimentalism in psychology and in fact established one of the first psychology laboratories in the world, introducing experimental psychology in the US and giving lab demonstrations to his students, at least as early as James's contemporary in Germany, uh, Wilhelm Wundt. James's experiments were far more wide-ranging than those of Wundt. Wundt insisted that only a very narrow range of experiments were scientifically valid, but James did not. Thus, whilst he and his students tested reaction times and the speed of nerve conduction, as did Wundt, and carried out reflex experiments on frogs' legs, they also engaged in such experiments as whirling frogs around to explore the function of the inner ear, or whirling deaf mutes around to test James's hypothesis that as the mute's semicircular canals were damaged, they should be less subject to dizziness than normal people. They also studied hypnosis and automatic writing, and James sometimes treated himself as an experimental subject, uh, for example, with studies of memory. For James, introspection was a major source of psychological insight. In this regard, he rejected the strict model of Wundtian introspection as unnatural and unworkable. James in introspection was essentially careful observation of his own perceptions, thoughts, and feelings. This could be achieved by self-training in awareness. He thought of his approach as being comparable to that of a naturalist observing the living world around him during a country walk. Just as with the naturalist, it was possible to train oneself to become more observant of the stimuli encountered. James recognized that his approach was a personal and non-scientific process, but he felt that this could be enormously productive in the insights it yielded. Without doubt, such introspection was difficult and prone to error, but in the case of simpler mental processes, these insights could later be checked through experimentation, and pragmatically, in the case of more complex mental processes, there was no other way of observing them. As to psychologizing, this was simply reflecting on ordinary observations and seeking plausible explanations for them. James could look at his own experience and understanding, and also the behavior and reported feelings of others. This wasn't a new technique, and was surely at the base of the insightful understanding of the human condition 
displayed by some great literary figures of the past, such as William Shakespeare. Finally, turning to James's impact on the development of academic psychology, uh, we can say on the one hand that he played a key role in the establishment of this new discipline, particularly in the United States, and that his teaching and writing had an enormous impact in the early development of the subject. But on the other hand, uh, his relationship with the developing discipline was complex and his influence was highly diffuse. In part, this was because he viewed psychology as an eclectic area of study which had not yet become a proper science and which therefore did not have sharply defined boundaries, but also because he never set out to establish a defined school of psychology. Rather, he imparted an interest in a wide range of psychological data to his students, uh, but he never tried to order this data within a comprehensive framework of knowledge or to restrict their interests. In the second part of this video, I will discuss some of James's specific ideas relating to psychology. Uh, I'll leave a discussion of the more philosophical aspects of his work to a later video. Thank you.